I am Coach Jay, and it's a pleasure to bring you today's class on dysregulation and regulation. I always start my classes with a corny dad joke, and here is today's. I just opened up my water bill and my electricity bill at the same time. I was shocked. But on bon all right, if you can take two deep healing breaths with me, preferably with your eyes closed, but however you feel most safe and comfortable. In through the nose, out through the mouth. One more time. All right. Uh, do you always or, you know, most of the time feel as if you're on high alert? Or do you just feel numb in life? Perhaps you bounce back and forth between the two. Have you ever wondered how to feel calm or peaceful or what it would be like to live in a state of peace and calm? If you find um, that the state of the world today that you live in especially triggering, you're not alone. Fortunately, by understanding our nervous systems and trauma responses, we can also understand and adopt new ways of calming our nervous systems to achieve enhanced well-being. Trauma changes the nervous system. It changes absolutely everything. But since I'm talking about dysregulation for this class, trauma certainly changes the nervous system. Complex developmental and relational trauma, which is CPTSD, can alter the nervous system to remain in a constant state of being um, prepared for danger. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example. I was at a restaurant last night with my family eating burritos. And in comes this person that had a long black coat on and I'm immediately, I'm on guard and I'm literally pulling out my chair because I'm thinking if they're holding a gun so they can open up fire, I'm jumping on them. And how ridiculous, it's like somebody walked in with a black coat on. So this is what I mean. Like you, you, everywhere you go, you are, you're on hyper vigilant, hyper alert, hyper aware of everything around you. And your brain is constantly setting yourself up for, this is definitely a potential danger. Trauma survivors may exist feeling on edge, hyper vigilant or um, hyper aroused. Some are most of the time, now, there's also the complete opposite, which is the numb aspect of this. Um, they could also feel disconnected, shut down. Um, some may feel a combination of the two. Sometimes you're hyper aroused, aroused sometimes hypo aroused. Um, chances are, because of the trauma that happened to you, changing your ability to feel steady and stable, your nervous system has a harder time regulating itself long after traumatic events of the past. Um, and I'd even venture to say that, you know, even with, with CBT and neuro, uh, you know, EBT and all this, you know, everything to, to heal with journaling and yoga and meditating and whatever, there's, oh, there's always going to be a reminder or a trigger. And so you, you know, it's like healing from trauma, betrayal trauma is like, uh, going to the gym. It's not like getting a degree. Once you have it, nobody can take it away. Once you go to the gym, like you got to kind of go periodically to maintain. It's the same thing with healing. I mean, you kind of got to check in and, and, and maintain things. You may find yourself living in a constant state of activation and imbalance, struggling to um, feel regulated or calm. Um, you know, I, I said before in one of my classes, <clears throat> somebody asked the Incredible Hulk, what do you have to do? How angry do you have to get? Um to become the Incredible Hulk. And he said, that's not the way it is. He's, he said, I'm always angry. I'm just constantly working at how to keep calm and peaceful so I don't turn into the Incredible Hulk. The second I stop working at being calm and peaceful, I immediately metamorphosize. And that's the way it is for somebody with trauma is that you have to constantly um, keep yourself regulated. If not, you will just live in a state of regulation, dysregulation. All right. Two main parts of the nervous system involved in the trauma response are the sympathetic nervous system, which protects you by activating the fight or flight freeze response. Um, this is what gets activated immediately in a trauma response. So for trauma uh, survivors that live in a state of hyper arousal, this part of the nervous system can stay activated and be in overdrive long-term. 
which has a lot of phys which has a lot of negative uh, uh, consequences, both physical and and otherwise. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system helps regulate and rest. So that's the rest and digest part of our body uh, nervous system. This restores your body to a state of calm ish. Because <laughs> if you're talking about somebody who has CPTSD, they're calm, and somebody who doesn't have CPTSD, and their calm is going to be completely different. Uh, it controls the body's ability to relax and regulate things like rest and digest and energy conservation, things like that. However, for trauma survivors who live in a constant state of hypoarousal, this is the hypo, um, uh, th this part of the nervous system can certainly steal the show, um, which I, I'll try to get into that a little later. These two symptom, symptoms usually work together automatically without a person's conscious effort. This isn't something you're conscious of. It's just reactions. However, you do have to be conscious, though, of how you regulate it. So it's kind of difficult because even though these are unconscious reactions, your responses have to be conscious. Um, so basically, um, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, it's harder for the parasympathetic to do its job. So your job is, like I said, to respond, to regulate yourself so the parasympathetic can come and take over and kind of put you into rest and digest. When the paras, when the um, sympathetic, I'm sorry, when the sympathetic nervous system is constantly activated, this chronic st stress can affect your immune system and your health. So, you know, there's people that are in a constant state of stress who years later have some significant physical ailments and they're like, well, what is the problem? What is the deal? And a lot of it, is from the constant stress because I don't want to get into all the neurology of this, but when cortisol is released, which is a numbing um, component, um, uh, chemical, geez, sorry, too much cortisol just starts to do damage because too because cortisol like um, uh, triggers your adrenaline, your adrenaline after a while triggers like um, uh, opioids. To, to, to kind of like completely numb and, and too much of that just starts doing damage to the body. But I don't want to get into all that right now. All right. Um, after trauma, the nervous system can remain prepared for danger. Nervous system reactions are exaggerated and extended for complex trauma survivors because they needed those responses so often when experiencing trauma simply to keep safe, you know? If a person experienced prolonged trauma or childhood trauma or CPTSD or relational trauma, those activated nervous systems responses become a part of their everyday lives. I always say that a lot of times we have to wear certain armor after we're traumatized. And if we don't deal with healing that armor, that kind of morphs into our personality as we get older. And then you hear people saying, well, that's just who I am. And really, it's not who they are. It's who they are evolved to be because they never removed that armor. Um, to protect them, their bodies started to live in a hyper arousal um, so they could notice the danger. I mean, you know, if you're staying up every night because you know one of your parents may come home drunk or some, you know, whatever the case is and come into your bedroom, you're going to be in a state of hyper arousal, getting your body prepared for that next trauma. Um, the nervous system uh, responses uh, stay even when the person becomes an adult who is currently safe and the responses are no longer necessary. Your body still remembers because your body keeps the score and your body stays in a constant state of prepare for danger, which is what happened with me at the restaurant the other day. Constant state of danger. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll go there. So those who haven't uh, endured trauma and were lucky enough to have had secure attachments growing up can really come back and center themselves much faster than those, you know, that have been through trauma. So what do you do? How do you calm your nervous system and help um, your body realize that you are uh, in a safe and present moment, that you are safe in the present moment? especially when your sympathetic nervous system is activated. You know, your body thinks that you are in imminent danger almost all of the time and your mind cannot realize that you are safe. Again, when you are constantly hyper aroused, hyper sensitive, um, hyper aware, 
it's very hard unless you consciously make a decision to calm your body down. And you know something? That's why I want to say very quickly, people that live with a lot of this kind of trauma, they're constantly exhausted. They're fatigued. It's like you can get up after a night's sleep, get up and drink, get a drink of water, and you're ready to go back to bed and take a nap. It's because you're constant. Every fiber of your being, every organ in your body, every, your mind, body, and soul, everything, your thoughts are how I can regulate myself. And boy, that gets tiring. So it's you're you're constantly working. Your body's working. Your mind, body, and soul is working all the time. You're tired. You're fatigued. I'm going to share some basic techniques that you, um, I'm sure, have already heard uh, probably multiple times. But sometimes it's good to bring these things to the forefront. Now, remember, while you may have um, positive impact in the moment, um, there doesn't always necessarily have to be a long-term impact on your nervous system, especially if you do a lot of counseling, a lot of therapy. But what it does is kind of dilute it. So, you know, um, three months after trauma, you could be on super hyper alert. And then three years after trauma, it's like you're aware of it, but you're not constantly on guard. Um, so I'm going to give you some techniques to where, you know, you've worked through some things and now you just want to kind of be proactive. It's like going to the gym after maintaining your ideal fitness goals. You know, now I got to go back every once in a while to maintain. These are ma maintenance things. Number one, simply just, and again, you've heard this, but slow breathing. And we did this at the beginning of this class. Now, one of the many reasons why slow breathing is important is because I think what happens, and I don't know the whole specifics and dynamics of this, but I think what happens is that our upper lung region gets tight if we're doing this this fast breathing. And when we do this fast breathing, it's because we feel like we're in imminent danger and we feel like we're in imminent danger because our fight or flight is you know triggered. So one of the things to do um, is slow and deep breathing because that calms your heart. Because when you're breathing quickly, you're, the capacity in your upper lungs kind of shrinks and that puts pressure on your heart, telling your heart you're in danger. But if you tell your heart, no, relax, I'm not in danger, that kind of undoes um, the ripple effect of, of you know, squeezing on your upper lungs and um, making your body feel safe. Um, one of, one of the things I encourage other people to do is notice five things in the room, you know, you know, five things that you can see, four things that you can touch, three things that you can smell, two things that you can hear, you know, whatever the case may be. There's also the rainbow technique. Um, okay. What do I see in the room? That's red. What do I see in the room? That's orange. What do I see in the room? That's yellow. What do I see in the room? That's, you know, you're basically trying to, um, engage your frontal cortex, the logical part of your brain. Um, also talk to Amy, who is Amy? Amy is your amygdala. Um, your amygdala is your, um, reptilian part of your brain that, that is constantly scanning the world for danger. Uh, uh Amy is your best friend because she does help you. But at the same token, if you're working on being safe, and if you're in an area where you're safe, Amy can be your worst enemy because she's constantly tell you, telling you you're unsafe, you're unsafe, but really you're not. So you have to talk to your friend, Amy, and say, Amy, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm safe. You're good. You don't have to, um, And listen, you're talking to yourself anyways. Don't tell me you're not. Throughout this whole process, I'm sure you've made you know comments about how could I be this and why didn't I do that and yada, yada. Now, if you're a guy and you don't want to talk to your friend, Amy, that's fine. Call him Elmo because um, the amygdala is shaped like an almond. So almond, El Elmo. Um, another thing too is uh, chew some gum or simply sit down. Why? Because years ago, and I'm talking, eight, you know, ages ago, we were running from, you know, bears and, and lions in the wilderness. And so um, uh, when you're sitting down, you're telling your system, wait a minute, you're not being chased by a wild animal. Maybe you're not in danger. So it's kind of tricking your body. Also chewing gum or something, because um, when you're eating, that's when your body is in rest and digest. And so it tricks your body to say, well, wait a minute, if you're chewing on something or you're eating, you really can't be in danger. And again, it tricks your body to say, okay, all must be good in the hood. I'm going to calm down. Um, another thing that I um, have people do is, you know, move, play, sing, um, belt out one of your favorite songs. Studies show that singing does a lot, a lot of good to, to, to regulate yourself. 
Um, one of my favorite techniques is to engage the frontal cortex um, is start doing some math facts. You know, four times four is 16. 16 minus one is 15. 15 times two is 30. 30 minus 10 is 20. And the, the more difficult you get, the more you're engaging the logic side. Another easy thing to do is count backwards from 100 using seven. So, okay, 100, seven, um, what is it? 80. That's what I'm saying. See, now I have to engage my frontal cortex. So, um, and the good thing with that, with that is that if you're home alone, you can do this. And if you're sitting in a boardroom meeting, you can do this quietly in your head. So you can do this anywhere. So I encourage you to try some of these techniques and see what works for you. These um, efforts go hand in hand with nurturing and thanking your activated nervous system for keeping you safe for all the years. Um, however, now it's time that you notice and deserve self-compassion. And again, telling your amygdala, I'm good. I'm in a safe place. Now you can also ask your amygdala when you get a trigger, what are you trying to tell me? Because there's no current threat. The threat is, is past. There's no current threat. So you can't threaten me anymore, but if you're here to inform me, I'm open to that. I'm not open to a threat. The threat's past, but I'm open to being informed and learning from this. Oh, what do I need threat? What do I need, Amy? Oh, I'm feeling disconnected. Okay, I can do things to feel connected. Oh, I'm feeling unattracted, unloved. Thank you. I can do things to feel attracted and loved, but I'm not in any threat anymore. The threats are past. Um, so um, help regulate yourself. Give yourself the gift to be calm. Give yourself the gift of um, regulating yourself. And um, if you have some other um, tips and, and, and techniques that you use that you find helpful, please feel free to share them um, because everybody could benefit from some tips and techniques on how to regulate themselves. So I hope you got something out of this class. And uh, until next time, take care of yourself, your body, your spirit, and then others.